seated. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O God, our Heavenly Father, with whom is grace and much forgiveness, be merciful to us who are born in sin and cannot but sin and fall short every day. Forgive us our many transgressions and atone them against us no more. But make us your heirs to Jesus Christ, your beloved Son who was delivered into death for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, if you uh, came over to the parsonage and visited my man cave down in the basement, you'd notice a few different things. It's kind of like a wildlife record. More taxidermy down there um, than the average individual. Uh, deer heads, ducks, pheasants, fish. Um, um, it's really kind of interesting. You know, one of my favorite objects of taxidermy in my man cave is a coffee table, a glass coffee table, with three wood ducks in it. And those three wood ducks are swimming in what looks like they're swimming in water. It's really a beautiful I can go down and sit in the basement and just stare for hours at those wood ducks. I think that wood ducks are, are some of the most beautiful animals on the planet. You look at their plumage, the feathers, the different colors, and depending upon which direction you're looking at it from, you see something different, you see it a, a different color, a different hue, and I just get mesmerized by that. And that also makes me think about something that Martin Luther once said about the beautiful truth of the teaching of justification by faith alone. He once, said, he, he once called the doctrine of justification the beautiful diamond, the crown jewel of the Bible. And he said that as you look at that, that beautiful jewel, and you look at it from different directions, you see all sorts of different nuances, different flashes, different uh, um, glimpses of beauty. And we see that in the scriptures. In Psalm 32, which is before us this morning, we see that the beautiful portrait that scripture paints of forgiveness, which is really kind of another word in scripture for justification, another different angle. And so this morning, I'd like us to help us, I'd like to help us see that beautiful portrait of forgiveness that's painted here in scripture. King David gives us three different vantage points here of this beautiful portrait of forgiveness. One, the first of all, he shows us the deep pit of sin. Then he shows us the courtroom of justification. And then finally he shows us and paints for us the choir room of Christian living. We'll first look at the deep pit of sin. This was something that David knew very, very well. Uh, Bible historians tell us that, that King, and actually King David did write this psalm. It, it's, it's in the inspired words of the psalm. And he wrote it after his incident of committing murder, uh, committing murder with Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, and committing adultery with her. Scripture tells us in the book of 2 Samuel that David went for well over a year without acknowledging this sin, without repenting of it, basically living in a state of not only impenitence, but also an unbelief. It was God who sent the prophet Nathan to, to, to David to lead him to repentance. 
And you probably remember the account, the story that Nathan told David about the poor man who had a lamb and his neighbor who came and stole it from him and gave it to his guest. David was enraged and he said, that man should die. And then Nathan pointed the finger to David and said, you are the man. You stole the wife of Uriah the Hittite from his arms. And immediately David was crushed. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord. David knew what it was like to be in the pit of sin. Listen to how David describes that year of his life without acknowledging his sin before the Lord. He said, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away as I groaned all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was dried up by the droughts of summer. If we ever think to ourselves that not acknowledging our sin or that confession isn't necessarily good for the soul, we neglect to realize the effects that sin has upon us. That sin that isn't repented has upon our souls, our minds, and our bodies. While David may have been prancing around making it look like everything was just fine, he tells us what was going on and how that sin, that guilt, had an effect on him. He kept silent and his bones wasted away. It had an effect on his body. Day and night, he could feel God's hand heavy upon him. His moisture, his very life essence was being dried up like the droughts of summer. Sin kills. Sin kills eternally. Sin, unrepented sin, has an effect on us when we don't bring it before the Lord. It's not a good thing. We act like we're happy, but we're not. Notice the first words of the psalm, and we come back to this in more detail. When David says, happy, how blessed, and really that term blessed really means um, a complete inner happiness. How happy is the person whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is covered? So many times during the course of my lifetime, and I've even been guilty of saying this myself, you know, God just wants me to be happy, okay? And you know what? That isn't a false statement. But our idea of happiness and God's idea of happiness very often are two completely opposite things, at least when it's our sinful nature in opposition to God. Our sinful nature thinks that we find happiness in rebellion, in sin, in things that God clearly calls that are wrong. And we think that we know better than God and are going to find happiness in those things. And have you found in your life that when you choose to go the opposite way that God has, to go against his will, that we rarely find happiness, it doesn't work out. Things seem to crumble underneath us. And yet our sinful nature tries to deceive us into thinking, that's happiness. No, it's misery. That is the pit of sin that our sinful nature wants to wallow in, like the pig in the pigsty, rolling and, and laying in the mud. And it's not good. It has eternal consequences of disaster. But thankfully, this isn't the end of the portrait. This isn't the end of God's work of art. David paints for us the courtroom of justification. When David says, how happy is the person whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the person whose guilt the Lord does not charge against him, and whose spirit there is no deceit. What a beautiful picture there is here of forgiveness and what God does. And it's in a courtroom. Martin Luther liked to call Psalm 32 the Psalm of the Apostle Paul. 
And the reason that he called this psalm that is because in this psalm in the Old Testament, God so clearly shows about how his plan of salvation, his plan of dealing with sin, has never changed. And it's the Apostle Paul who quotes this psalm in Romans chapter 4, that beautiful, beautiful section of scripture that so, so clearly puts before us the doctrine of the Bible of justification. A courtroom where we come in and we are guilty. We have committed the crime. All of the evidence is there that convicts us. And as we stand in that courtroom and the evidence is presented, our defense lawyer, Jesus, stands up and he takes that guilty burden for us. He takes the punishment and then the judge declares us innocent, not guilty. What a beautiful, beautiful picture that is because it shows that there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. There is no good work that we can do that, that, that we can perform to make up for the evil that we have done. And despite the way that, that the world and our sinful nature likes to think that says, okay, if I do one thing wrong and one thing good, that evens out God's scale of justice. That's not how it works. Sin needs to be paid for, and it can be only paid for by Christ. The innocent verdict that he earned becomes ours. But that's not the only part of that gem that we get to see. The term forgiveness is not only spelled out in that innocent verdict, but in the term forgiveness, where God carries away and takes away our sin. David says, blessed is the man whose sins are covered. He was thinking about in his day about a beautiful ritual that took place once a year in the temple where sins where an animal was sacrificed and the blood of that animal was sprinkled in the most holy place of the temple on the atonement cover that part of the Ark of the Covenant that was in the place in that holy of holies in the temple that was supposed to be where the presence of God was. That cover, that blood was to be the covering for our sins, for their sins. You see the picture there? That blood that was put on the atonement cup pointed ahead to the blood that Jesus would shed for us. That blood of Jesus that covers the sins of the world, yours and mine. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin as covered covered by the holy, precious blood of our Savior, Jesus. What a beautiful picture that is. And then the final picture that David gives us in the psalm is the choir room of Christian living. This was something that David had to share. This joy of salvation, this joy of forgiveness, because David knew what it was like to be under that burden of sin and in that misery. And so, when he heard and received that precious message of forgiveness from his Savior, and how much that had freed him, he needed to share that with the people of those, those people around him, and with us. That's the reason that he wrote this song. If you look in your bulletin at, at, at the top, on page 11 and at the top there by the sermon text, it tells us who the song was written by, and then it has a different term there that we're not used to. It calls it says a maskil. That's a Hebrew word which which means a part of wisdom or a teaching. This is almost like having a catechism lesson, where David is teaching us from his experience and saying, "This is what sin does to us, but this is what forgiveness does, and this is what we need to share." This is our joy to share, and we often do this. If it's not in our personal lives, in our homes, or with our friends, or with, uh, with, with, with people who are asking us why we follow the Lord Jesus, it's with each other here, too, when we come and worship. 
as we sing songs of joy to the Lord, and we encourage one another in that gift of forgiveness that all of us have been given through our Savior Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is the beautiful truth that we see in this portrait of forgiveness, that the only way that you or I or anyone in this world can find happiness, that can find bliss, contentment, is in the blood of Christ, in the forgiveness of sins. Yes, we have all sinned and fallen far short of the glory of God. And if we don't realize that, we need to get down on our knees review our lives under God's Ten Commandments and see how we have violated them every single one numerously every single day and that we deserve nothing but His wrath and punishment. But that forgiveness is there. It has been won by Christ and His ours through faith. And it is only through that forgiveness that we find happiness, bliss, contentment. It is the greatest gift that we have from God. One of the, the most beautiful thing on this earth. And like I like to sit and stare at my beautiful wood ducks. May all of us, you and me included, sit and look and contemplate and treasure this wonderful portrait, this wonderful artwork of forgiveness that God gives us only through our Savior Jesus Christ. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find them on page 12 in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the collection. 